Hey peeps. Today let's go over abdominal surgical incisions for the pelvic surgeon. This is highlighted in one of ACOG's uh, surgical curriculum resources, so really important to know for test taking, but then also in real life. We can't start talking about incisions until we're certain about anatomy. Um, the anterior abdominal wall anatomy is extremely important for safe entry into the abdomen, and there are two muscle groups, I'd say. Um, the flat muscles, which are your internal oblique, external oblique, and then your transverse subdominus. And then you have uh, muscle groups that run vertically, which are the pyramidalis here, and then also your rectus abdominis. Um, and then other landmarks here, you have your linea alba, and then also of note, the arcuate line. So um, I have a different presentation on the arcuate line. We'll just go over it briefly here. And so what is it? Uh, it is a horizontal line um, that demarcates the lower limit of the posterior layer of the rectus sheath. And so if you're looking here, you can see that this posterior rectus sheath is here and it is not here. Um, superior to the arcuate line, the internal oblique aponeurosis splits anterior and posterior to the rectus abdominis. So that's in this picture up here. And then inferior, the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis um, aponeuroses merge and they pass anterior to the rectus muscle. So go check out that other PowerPoint if you want to know a little bit more. Here are some slides from there about the arcuate line. The blood supply to the anterior abdominal wall, um, the inferior epigastric, we uh, definitely need to know the origin of the inferior uh, epigastric, and I like to think of IE and then EI um, if you're trying to memorize it, um, but we can also just think about it anatomically. It comes off of the external iliac. This course is posterior to the lateral one-third of the rectus muscle, and so you can see it in both of these pictures here. Then you also have your superior epigastric, which comes off of the internal thoracic or internal mammary. Uh, and then you also have deep circumflex, which is also off of the external iliac. Um, we see this in our groin dissections, and um, it's a border of the pelvic lymph node dissection. So I really like this picture here because it shows a nice uh, view of the superior and inferior epigastrics here, and then also the uh, intercostal and subcostal arteries, which supply the lateral abdominal wall. And so um, we will talk about the inferior epigastric um, a little bit later in one of our incisions. Um, really important to know the um, blood supply and where these are located. And then similarly, we're looking at the innervation of the anterior abdominal wall. Um, a lot of intercostal nerves here. Some of the nerves that we uh, want to pay a lot of attention to are the ilioinguinal and the iliohypogastric nerves that run um, on the surface of the anterior abdominal wall and can be injured by our incisions. Um, they don't necessarily supply the anterior abdominal wall, but um, the lower pelvic region, the mons, and then the, um, the thigh. So being aware of the anatomy and knowing um, where these are is extremely important. Okay, so let's get into our abdominal incisions that we're going over today. Um, we'll go over a vertical incision, a fan and seal, a maillard, a churny, and a custner incision. And so you may be asking yourself, well, why, why does this matter? Why does it matter if I just do a fan and seal for every single case? Why do I need to know these other types of incisions. I'm never going to use them. Um, and we'll go over this paper later, but I found this, there was this quote from a paper that we'll talk about when we talk about the Kustner. Um, and it, it says basically the choice is, of an abdominal incision isn't founded in science and instead it's primarily chosen by familiarity. And I do agree with that. And I do think surgeons should be mostly doing the incisions that they are most comfortable with. However, if you're called into a surgery as a consulting surgeon, and you need more exposure, you need to know how to get there. Um, and when you're planning these cases, if someone has abnormal anatomy or the case calls for, I'm not sure, but you need to know your options and you need to pick what the best incision type for the patient and the surgery is. So it definitely matters. So we'll start with the vertical midline. 
I think that most of you all are familiar with this and have seen this before. It's uh, very easy, very versatile, easily extended for more exposure. It's quick, little blood loss because you're going through the linea alba of the rectus. Um, of note here, we see that um, this, ha this incision goes around the, umb the umbilicus. Some people um, will go right through it. I personally will go on the right of the umbi, and that is um, just in case the patient needs an ostomy. Um, it typically will go on the left side. And so um, this is one abdominal incision. Fan and steel, I know everyone has done a fan and steel here. Um, the incision is as you know, usually made two finger breaths above the pubic bone. I actually really love this picture because it shows the iliohypogastric nerve, which we talked about before. You can um, accidentally get that with your incision, typically about 10 centimeters in length. It has good exposure to the central pelvis, but does limit exposure to the lateral pelvis and the upper, ab upper abdomen. It is cosmetically nice and has um, shown to be to have less pain as an incision type. Okay, getting into some of the less familiar incisions, the Maillard incision is a transverse incision through all the layers of the abdominal wall. It usually is at the level of the anterior iliac spine. It has great exposure to the pelvic sidewalls because you're going through the muscle. Um, one really uh, important question here is what um, what is essentially what are the contraindications to doing a Maillard incision? And um, if someone has peripheral artery disease, you should not use this because you're going, uh, when you're going through here, what you run into is the inferior epigastric vessels. And so these need to be ligated. Um, and because you're going through these, the risks here are bleeding and possible hematoma formation. You're going through the rectus muscles, you're going, you're ligating the inferior epigastric vessels. Um, and so there is some risk. And here's just another picture here of going through the rectus with, um, they're using a bobe or a knife. And so this is one way, and I've also seen people call it a modified Maillard if you're just going through some of the muscle in your surgery. Okay, and so we're getting less familiar as we go along, but this is a churny incision. It's a transverse incision. Um, skin and fascia similar to a Maillard, and then the rectus mu muscles are separated from um, the pubic symphysis and, and the pyramidalis muscle. And then the, a plane is developed between the tendons and the, the rectus um, and the underlying fascia. Um, typically, this is cut with uh, electrocautery from the pubic bone and they're retracted upwards. Um, this gives you exposure to the space of retius and then also the pelvic sidewall, if you can imagine the rectus muscles being reflected upward. And here are just the steps here um, and another picture here of how you would make the churny incision. Um, and so you can look through those steps but I like this picture, I think, the most, probably because there's color on it. But I think it demonstrates the best on how um, the tendon is cut from the pubic bone. You do want to leave some tendon um, there because you need to reattach it at the end. Um, and so then this, is, this portion is being shown horizontal mattress stitches um, to incorporate that lower rectus sheath fascia as well. And then the Kustner incision is, um, the I would say, the least common. Uh, in the literature, it is noted that it has limited utility. Um, and there are actually some conflicting views on this incision type. I've never seen it done in person. Um, but it's a transverse skin incision. It's about five centimeters above the symphysis. It's below the ASIS. And then you do a vertical incision on the linea alba. Um, some disadvantages, you can't, it really can't really extend. Um, it has been noted to be time consuming and it increases um, the risk of infection. And this is why. Um, here are the steps here, but uh, you do your skin subcutaneous like a fan and steel or like um, a churny. And then the subcutaneous cephalic layer is raised and dissected from the fascia up to the umbilicus. And this is where people think that they're 
um, are, is a higher infection risk. Um, and then there's a vertical incision along the linea alba. The fascia is sewed, sewed closed like we do for everything else. And then the fat tissue is fixed to the fascia with the two interrupted because you took this off. And so this is, that is where um, possible infection can occur. Um, and some, uh, I put, actually, I put this resource in here for you to read um, a little bit more about the Custer technique. Because some people find that it uh, has good surgical exposure and people have less post-op pain. So some people really like it. Read more about it if you'd like to. Um, but ACOG does mention that it is um, uncommon and has not a lot of utility. All right, so those are the incision types, at least for the pelvic surgeon. Um, like I said, ACOG does have a surgical curriculum, and this is one of the um, categories of it. Um, I also used access medicine, some general surgery text, and then um, some OBGYN text, and I don't own any of these pictures. So let me know if you have any questions um, or comments on these incision types, which one's your favorite, and... Otherwise, have a good day.